So the next speaker is uh, Joao. And okay, this is a long title. Yeah. So, but he's going to talk about large and by local field uh, theory. Okay, and this, so this is for the. Then this is for the skill. Okay. okay. All right, good morning. Uh, I'd like to thank Vishnu for the invitation to give a talk. So, this is the title of the talk. It's about the very fixed point of the three dimensional Owen invariant vector theory um, using the collective field approach or the bilocal field approach. This is work that uh, has been done with my student, Babalevo Mundokwe. Should be here somewhere. There it is. And it actually goes back, as I'll explain, uh, several years. And uh, so, this, uh, so, what is the plan of the talk? Essentially, some motivation, a brief uh, introduction to the collective Hamiltonian, uh, the description of the critical point using the non linear signal model. Then the path integral, which is based on uh, uh, covariant by locals. I'll explain all this as I will go along. And then uh, show how that links to the Hamiltonian and uh, discuss the issue of the uh, delta equals to 1 and uh, delta equals to 2 states. Um, so what is the motivation? I think um, it's been presented here several times. But uh, So I'm going to be working strictly in three dimensions. So um, in the Vazilyev Heisman theory with the scalar having delta equals to 2 has been conjectured to be dual to the critical OM vector model. This goes back to Plevanov and Polyakov in 2002. Um, the advantage of working with vector models is that in principle they're solvable, even though and the larger limit, and allow it possibly can allow a more detailed study of the ADS CFT correspondence. I'd like to mention some early attempts at, constru at the constructive approach from, uh, by Schumann and Antal. Uh, and I think Schumann briefly mentioned that in his talk uh, in terms of splitting the central mass motion from the uh, relative motion. But then uh, further evidence for the conjecture then includes uh, uh, this computation of the three-point function by Jung and Ng, the two to force. It really uh, resulted in a flurry of interest in the theory. Uh, reconstruction of the bulk, which is work that uh, has been done with Robert Antal and at the time uh, one of his postgraduate students in 20, 2010, uh, which is going to be the basis of uh, the motivation for the, uh, this presentation. And then further checks, such as the free energy at one loop, that have been done. Uh, it's supposed to be very simple. I think all that is supposed to be happening is that if you have a free scalar, uh, you have a state on the boundary that is a delta equals to 1, uh, with the novel's dimension delta equals to 1, and that should simply be replaced by a state on delta equals to 2 for a critical scale. Uh, um, However, what I'd like to do is to understand it a little bit better and I'll explain why uh, uh, it may be necessary to go into a little bit of more detail on how this comes about. First of all, um, the, um, we want to start with a description in terms of Hamiltonians. And this is because uh, uh, so let me display everything here. So, what we'd like to do is to, the starting point is going to be a description in terms of a Hamiltonian. Uh, for the description in terms of a Hamiltonian, we look at uh, equal time by local, so this would be the variables which we're going to be considering. So it's, uh, it's you take 5.5, but you make sure that the time is the same. And uh, I'm working in three dimensions, so both x1 and x2 are two dimensional vectors. So there are five degrees of freedom there, which is time plus uh, two times two. And uh, in the original work, which was based in the Hamiltonian approach, these five degrees of freedom are, and their contradictive momentum are mapped 
in the UV, so that's the free theory, to the ATS4 times S1. So the S1 comes about encoding the spin degrees of freedom into a circle, and the ADS4 um, then gives you 4 coordinates, so 4 plus 1 is equal to 5. Uh, so the map has been generalized to the temporal gauge because originally it was done in the light cone gauge a few years later. And uh, I think, I, so, so this is really the motivation why we would like to understand from uh, the Hamiltonian point of view the simple question that was asked already many years ago. So what happens at the critical point if you use the same approach? Now you will see in what follows that if instead of considering the Hamiltonian approach, you look at the path integral, where naturally you have uh, you have covariant binoculars, in other words, 3 plus 3 is 6 dimensions, then as Antal has mentioned, uh, you should be then trying to understand an ADS4 cross S2. Uh, it's a much cleaner and a much more uh, simpler description of the system. Uh, but uh, you, but uh, as, as I explained, the original motivation for the, for the map was in terms of the 5 ADS4 cross S1. So of course, in the meantime, there's been progress that Antal has reported on in terms of these uh, conformal partial waves. Uh, so to some extent, this is going to be a somewhat pedestrian presentation. Uh, compared to some of the others here, but hopefully I'll convince you that there are some interesting puzzles that need to be well, that I think one can understand. So just to highlight what were the main ideas of this, this will be the results and what this map is about. So the temporal gauge map in momentum space is point-like. It's a phase-space map that turns out to be point-like in momentum space. So if you have, uh, so the energy, this is the, are the ADS4 momentum coordinates relate to the, yeah? Uh, the spins are representations of SO3, right? Right. So how, how, how do they come about from an S1? Mm -hmm. So remember in the light cone gauge, basically all you have to worry about is that you fix and it's basically just the elicity. Ah, so you, you look at the SO2 of the SO3? Yes. And uh, so that is, these are the, the, the four coordinates, if you want to remember the space of um, ADS4. Uh, it's useful to remember, so this is how the Z, which is the new coordinate that appears, uh, the holographic coordinate, is related to the bilocal variables. And I think the only thing important to remember is the fact that uh, uh, it's proportional to the difference to the relative coordinates, so the boundary is defined when the, the bilocals are uh, calculated at the same point, x1 is Right, so we start then with the Lagrangian. This is uh, with a standard mass and important interaction. Uh, lambda is already a toothed parameter. So the idea of the collective, uh, collective field theory is a change of variables from uh, the original degrees of freedom to a new set of degrees of freedom that are invariant. Uh, and in this case, the leading form of that uh, Jacobian is given here. This is only in the leading form, and I think uh, it has been presented by others. In general, how just a brief uh, not a, uh, presentation of what's involved in this uh, electrical theory in Hamiltonian. Basically, you just use, so you start off with uh, some original variables xA, and you change variables to a set of invariants uh, with a index by a capital letter, capital A. This is a, a kinetic piece of uh, the Hamiltonian. You use the chain rule, and you get two types of contributions, one which is the uh, uh, linear in the first derivative, and the second derivative one. Uh, these are the definitions of these quantities. And basically what you require is you want to make sure that uh, you require that the um, momentum operator is explicitly emission with the, give, taking into account this Jacobian. Uh, if you require that condition, and this is working, 
a result that goes back now many years by Yavitsky, Anton, and then Sakita. You can actually get a close expression for that law. Uh, and uh, in this case, then you then plug it back in and you get a Hamiltonian, which is then referred to as the collector Hamiltonian. And the form of that Hamiltonian is given there. So I just wanted to give a flavor of what's involved in this, but I wanted to also present what is immediately the very powerful, if you are able to parameterize these invariant spaces uh, of this approach. If you look here, you end up, um, you will see that uh, you have rescaled the field so that the original action or potential in this case is proportional to n. And you see that there is a new term that goes like the trace of psi to the minus one. This is in functional space, which comes in with an n. The kinetic piece is, uh, goes down like one of n, which means as you take the limit as n goes to infinity, the large n configuration becomes just a cell point, uh, which minimizes the effect of potential. The, the kinetic piece is, uh, is like having an oscillation with an infinite mass, and therefore uh, it's an approach with a large n limit is semi-classical in this very precise way. Uh, yeah. If you were to to derive this from path integrals, you find this measure factor which would in general have two times in it. Yes, so I'll come to that. Okay. So, so this was the starting point, this was the starting question, what happens at the Newtonian level because we had this nice map in terms of counting number of variables. But then to actually make sense of what I'm going to show you, I then go to the two time and then map back. Okay. Right. So, okay, so the larger limit, you, the kinetic term is a meaning, and the several point analysis on just take the derivative gives the data. This is a gap equation. Uh, so, one integrates both sides to obtain the standard gap equation. So, uh, immediately, if, remember these are equal time uh, two point functions. So, essentially, you've integrated over the energy. Uh, so, it's very, this is nothing but the standard. Uh, uh, gap equation with phi dot phi, s defined by phi dot phi is equal to 1 over square root of k squared. So if you, you can write it in a standard way, if I call alpha to be m squared plus uh, lambda over 6s, this is s is equal to, you, this is an integrated over, so I move on to the k, uh, one dimensional ion. So I'm now going to an integral of E. So this is nothing but the propagator with an effective mass, um, mass squared of K. So this is the standard approach. Uh, now, I'm going through the, the, the paradigm of the approach that I'm going to choose in terms of regularization is that of a rule. Uh, that has done a lot of work in the nonlinear sigma model approach that I'll briefly discuss just now. But this is the regularization that we use. And uh, if you get use that regularization, you see that um, consistently using d equals to 3, even though these equations are valid between strictly greater than 2, strictly less than 4, we get a quadratic fixed uh, equation. And the invariant fixed point is associated with the root. And I think we, all we need to do is to remember that, perhaps. So that's phi dot phi, which I call s. Uh, it has to be equal to minus 6 m squared over lambda. So uh, why is this called the equal rate limit? So this has been referred to earlier on. I mean, this is the uh, point of symmetry breaking of our potential. If we go back to the tree, the effective potential at three level is nothing but the general the potential. So if the mass squared is negative, uh, you get a situation of symmetry breaking, and that's uh, what defines then the infrared limit as uh, this goes to, to zero. So we keep m squared minus m squared fixed, and we take the limit as lambda equals to infinity, and that's how this, the infrared uh, uh, critical point is, is obtained. So and in that case, so the mass goes to zero, alpha goes to zero, there it is. And uh, therefore, the, uh, so we call this the conformal fixed point, the bilobals are given by, so this is a massless propagator, equal time massless propagator, um, which we need in order to have a move towards a conformal field. 
Now, so this was the large end limit of, uh, so we remember we had, a, we had a kinetic piece plus a potential, we expanded about the, the minimum of the potential, now we calculate fluctuations about this potential, so this is how it's done, it's, uh, so this is the large end uh, background configuration, and then you, and uh, it goes like 1 over square root of n times the meter, these are the small fluctuations and the corresponding uh, momenta or scales as to preserve the, the standard computation relation. So you, Antal has already emphasized the star structure of, the, of, the, of this um, interactions that is uh, that result from this uh, trace of uh, psi to the minus one uh, or log psi if you are doing the Euclidean approach or the the Parkinson approach. But all you have to do is to collect the terms that are quadratic in the fluctuations, so we find, so these uh, bilocals are now denoted by eta, and uh, so you get then this uh, set, uh, quadratic Hamilton. So if lambda was zero, this would be the fluctuations, so the, the, the quadratic Hamilton is associated with those fluctuations, now we have that term lambda. And you notice immediately and that you will see that in momentum space, that uh, this one has a trace structure, the two, and we use that one is local. And that makes it, of course, for some interesting physics. So, so you can go into momentum space and uh, basically uh, well, you look at Hamiltonian's equations of motion. This is a quadratic uh, um, Hamiltonian. You assume that uh, you get an equation for the eigen, eigen energies, if you want, of the of that system. And this is the equation that one gets. So if lambda is zero, this term is not there. So this is uh, the term that would be eta xx, essentially for you. There is this additional, it's proportional to lambda. And uh, if this term wasn't there, it basically would tell you that the energy that you allow energies was just the sum of the energies of these two particles. And, uh, and this, it's, you know, that would be one of the four, the four uh, um, equations in the method I presented, where e is equal to u1 plus u2, p is equal to p1 plus u2, and so on. So the question is, what happens? How does that, is the map affected in any way by the presence of that term? So the first thing you would do when you look at an equation like this is to try and write it in that form and then uh, try and uh, be clever about finding the dispersion relation, what is E in terms of K1 and K2, or actually K1 plus K2. So, um, it's not difficult to see that, uh, that uh, by integrating both sides, because uh, if you look, this only depends on the sum of the two momenta. So if you integrate both sides, the left-hand side becomes the same as that factor there. So essentially, this, this integrated quantity here has to be 1. Okay. So for a solution to exist, which means by that you need to find that, that uh, energy, that we, one needs to ensure that this equation is satisfied. So that's quite a tough uh, integral equation that I studied over to the head over the years. So now I want to tell you a little bit about how we understand. So I'm going to do a detour. So I'm going to take you then to the, uh, I think there's a well-known result, which I can quickly sketch, if any, but I think uh, Shiraz has already implicitly mentioned it, which is that you can introduce a, um, a um, auxiliary field. And uh, in the, these are three-dimensional uh, theories in the limits of this uh, auxiliary field alpha in this case uh, as uh, dimension 2 so we have a term that goes like sigma squared that is irrelevant as a naive rate right? and if you neglect that term basically you get a, a nonlinear sigma model and that's the form of the nonlinear sigma model as it's normally used there's a I thought I had written here the, there's a large number of uh, work, considerable work 
that is done by rule and land, or land and rule and limit and rule, where they immediately take the knee. Um, if uh, the, 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 the critical point, as we will see, is taken by taking, by taking London to, to infinity, and uh, you can actually work directly in the ethical form of one. So, uh, in this case, you see that instead of having the tra trace of uh, psi to the minus one, uh, but this is just in the pop logical point of view. It's also with the Euclidean signature, which is what's standard in this, uh, in this approach. And you will see that this is the, the term that comes from the change of variables. It's just the new exponential of the Jacob. So the bilocals are now covariant by local. In other words, you now have three plus three six uh, degrees of freedom uh, because the times are the, 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 the times are in general different. Okay. So you, you again see that it is uh, expressed in this way. This is uh, the effect that the action is proportional to n. So again, you get a settled point condition for large limit. And you immediately in the gap equation is not uh, so you will get the gap equation by differentiating with respect to psi as well as alpha. Differentiating with respect to alpha gives you the gap equation, uh, and uh, which is just equal to one over lambda. So, and uh, again, what I point out here is perhaps it's useful to remember that uh, even though in practice uh, the nonlinear Simon model is uh, used with this. With this convention of one over lambda, if you want to relate it to the original fight of the fourth theory, that's actually the relationship that we have. It's, it's minus m squared of lambda 4. This is just to remind you that that's the fight of the fourth theory. Okay. So at the infrared fixed point, lambda goes to infinity, and the large animal formal background propagator is uh, 1 over k squared, and alpha 0 equals to 0 that comes from. This expression. Okay, so you expand, and the, so you expand about that configuration again with one of the square root of n dependencies. Both the both the, the um, this is a dynamical Lagrange multiplier. It's ultimately the sigma field that Shiraz mentioned, uh, and you you collect the terms that are quadratic. You have to do a, a field with the well. You have to shift the field theta. I, I don't want to go through the details. It's pretty straightforward. At the end of the day, the key point is that you end up with a decoupled system of, uh, of um, well, you do the, the sum of two quadratic uh, terms. One that is quadratic in eta. Remember, these are the high locals. And uh, one that is simply just uh, the alpha the Lagrange multiplier. So this is in momentum space. So if you, this is straightforward then to, to invert, because everything is, is uh, diagonal, in momentum space, the inverse of uh, mod k is uh, one of k is k, uh, and that is the signature of a delta equals 2 to step. In other words, if you calculate the correlators of eta x1, x2, eta x3, x4, this is what you get. If you calculate the correlators of alpha x1 of x2, you get 1 over x mod x to the fourth, and that's precisely the signature of a delta equals to two states, which is also in agreement with its um, uh, engineering dimensions in this case. Uh, I want to point out that if you were to calculate, if you set x1 equals to x2 and x3 equals to x4, you, either, you immediately recognize that those are boundary fields with delta equals to 1 because uh, this would then go like x uh, not x squared. Okay. So, so this is now a little bit of a puzzle because uh, uh, this is a, a, a... You see that if you were to take a set face value, there is no evidence by looking at this propagator that the delta equals to one state has vanished, vanished from the spectrum. Indeed, there's a clear signature of delta equals to two being associated with the, with the Lagrange multiplier, but the delta equals to one seems to be perfectly there 
and therefore how does that constellation work. So what I'm going to do then is I'm going to go back to the flight to the fourth theory, but again do the path integral. And to do the path integral, again we introduce, as I've just done, uh, two time bilocals or covariant bilocals, which will depend on six coordinates. Um, so I am using in this chapter because I want to link the two to the Hamiltonian. I'm using a Lorentzian signature. So the large end background I've already explained is a fine mode equals to i over k squared. And for the quadratic action, you can it's uh, you shift again with one over square root of n, and then, then this is the quadratic action that one gets. This comes from the Jacobian. It's got the trace structure from. It, uh, from the Jacobian. This is nothing but uh, the fight to the full uh, theory expressed in terms of bilocal, so it's eta x x squared. So, as usual, this is quadratic. You write it in the form of a field, operate the field, and we try when you operate the field, uh, the operator then in momentum space. This is all done in momentum space, then uh, takes this obvious force form. Sorry. Now, now note that this is the this would be the uh, disconnected part as we're going to show once you revert this. It's nothing but the propagation of two and three um, bosons in terms of the underlying picture, and this is the term that is uh, in, that, that is dependent on a direction. Note that the momentum conservation flows differently. So here, basically, the particles they get dressed, but they propagate freely. And uh, here you just have the usual uh, overall momentum conservation. So this can be inverted. Uh, so the way to do this, when we studied this with Robert several years, not many years ago, uh, both for fermions and both for uh, bosons. Um, and in addition, I, I am aware that in the work Schubert and uh, and I have certainly looked at the vertex part of this uh, um, bilocal two-point function, but the form is this one. So this is the answer. So essentially, the, the, so this is a it's a propagator of bilocals. So it's an underlying Schrodinger equation or beta Salpeter equation in terms of the origin of the four-point. Beta solve the equation in terms of the original variables. Uh, it consists of two pieces. The first piece is what you'd expect is just a free, is all just a free, um, well, remember it is dressed, so one of the p squared is being dressed because uh, you've taken a mass and run and so on. But basically, this is the free part, and this is the vertex part. And uh, so essentially, you have. It's uh, maybe to keep in mind that you yeah, this plus something that I write as I lambda one plus I lambda times a double, which is the structure and, uh, that you have there. And that bubble is here. These are the external legs. Uh, so therefore, when you look at uh, normally what uh, you, one does is one looks at the one pi of the vertex functions, and so you would zero in on this uh, on this portion of this uh, function. Okay. So you can actually integrate. This is a finite integral. Remember, we're working in three dimensions, so there's no issue of uh, regularization needed. And the answer is that uh, this integral, this double diagram, is one of uh, I use uh, Euclidean P1 plus P2. So, in summary, so if you if lambda was zero, of course you would only have the two free propagating particles. Uh, but in addition, now we have uh, we have this uh, vertex function with uh, with this specific form. Okay. So one thing you guys on the spot. So this is what I just stated. That consists of a free disconnected piece. And the next channel scattering state, as I call it. Because it's K1 plus K2, only depends on the sum of the two dimensions. Right, so I think 
Diego says, since in the garden or something, one runs to them and says, look, I look at the propagate, and you will ask yourself how they pose in that propagate. It should give you some information about potential uh, on shell conditions. So that's the that's the pole condition, right? So, uh, so that's something that is immediately of interest here and that we will discuss it, that is that this requires, in order for one to satisfy that, it requires that the tooth coupling is negative. Okay. Now, whether it's negative or positive, you can square and you see that you get this dispersion relation that tells you that the energy of this uh, object is, uh, is, is, is uh, energy squared is negative and it obeys that dispersion relation was like one squared. Now, um, irrespective of the sign of lambda, irrespective of the sign of lambda, you see that something quite interesting uh, happens as you take, as you approach the, the, the critical point. When you approach the critical point, you see that uh, um, if I go back, Yeah. You see, you've got lambda, you've got lambda, you take the limit as lambda goes to infinity, and basically this becomes totally finite. And you now continue to have this disconnected piece plus a finite part that uh, is now very similar in maps almost entirely, well, maps essentially entirely with what we obtain using the nonlinear signal model, except for these external layer factors which in any case we normally remove in order to study the, 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 the vertex functions. Okay. Now, now note also that this is now linear in momentum, in the numerator. So it's not difficult to realize that this is then the signature of the delta equals to two state. Alright, so this is in agreement up to like factors in the delta equals to two channel with the results obtained from using the nonlinear signal. So, um, so what I want now to look at is, remember we started off with an Hamiltonian approach and suddenly I went into the path integral, I got a propagator, and we got a condition for the pole of that propagator. Uh, the, the condition for the pole of the propagation should also be the same as the result of the equations of motion, which is just that operator O e t equals to zero. So in the two-time formalism, that's the equation that one gets. And again, you, you can find a solution to that equation. You integrate on both sides. If this is satisfied, and as expected, this is nothing but the fault condition. So this is now the technical result that took us a bit of time to go through, to, to, to figure out and to derive which is that uh, basically if you start off with this uh, covariant expression for this uh, bubble diagram uh, and you actually integrate the energy which is essentially a, an intermediate energy you get precisely this very complicated function that appeared in the Hamilton. So the, to return then to the Hamiltonian so remember that we have this expression which we look for a solution of that form, and we say that you say that the consistency requirement is equivalent to the pole condition, which has a solution if lambda is negative, uh, essentially a tachyonic uh, bound state uh, if uh, lambda is negative, and uh, it's, there's, no, there's no physical state if lambda is positive. So, the puzzle then has been so where remember this is not only a field. We essentially we, we saw the signatures of delta equals to one two state, but uh, the whole map was built on the basis of the free part, of, if you want, of that uh, propagator. Okay, so if you look here. This was the free part that essentially allowed us to go the bulk in that map. So where are those states? So this so 
So the answer to that question, which uh, obviously with hindsight is pretty uh, straightforward, is that those states, you must, you, the way to think about the situation is in term, as, as a potential scattering. So the solution, so potential scattering, you can have a bound state indeed, but you have scattering states. And so far, I've only discussed a bound state in the case that lambda is negative. Okay. So, this, so the scattering state solutions to the potential scattering problem are then given by this expression. So what you do is you add a term, which is essentially the quantum mechanical epilogue, to stay incident way. Uh, except, and, uh, so it's all the three equations of motion, and uh, so if you choose uh, some typical incident wave with momentum P1 and P2, that's what it is in momentum space. And uh, so what is unusual about this is when you do scattering problems, you normally don't ask yourself, or you know, you tell this is just a picture, it's a time independent uh, uh, picture of your scattering. You, bold wave packets away from the, far from the scatterer. So you tend not to worry about what happens at the value of the wave function at, at, uh, at the position of the scatterer. But that's precisely what we try, what we're trying to establish is what is the value of eta xx, which in terms of local coordinates, obviously it's where the two points coincide. So, so what happens? So you can integrate both sides of that equation and express uh, uh, the integral over your fluctuations or over your field in terms of uh, the integral corresponding integral over the three waves and then plug it back in and you get that expression. So now everything is expressed in terms of things that you know. And you can now take the limit as lambda goes to infinity. And you, it's quite clear, so it's quite obvious either there or, or maybe even here, that as lambda goes to infinity, at the formal infrared fixed point, as lambda goes to infinity, we find that eta xx then goes to zero. So, uh, so that is the delta equals to 1 is, uh, after all, a scattering state that is removed from the spectrum at the boundary. And for lambda negative, the delta equals to 2 is, is a bound state. Now, right, so I now return to the by local propagator that I had in terms of the path integral approach. Because remember, this is as the cleaner signal is, is totally finite, it's independent of lambda. And uh, we want to make sure that it uh, satisfies, it's consistent with some of the properties uh, that, uh, that one expected and which we obtained in terms of the um, Hamiltonian picture. Uh, so after to uh, just change quickly into a premium signature. Again, you have the free propagating um, particles, and here you have the vertex function with the external uh, legs. So, one can establish several results. First of all, if you were to calculate the correlator between eta xx and eta yy, you get zero, as you should, since the state it shouldn't be there. Now, but in order to do that, you need to take into account, so there are very precise cancellations between the disconnected pieces of that uh, uh, propagator and the connected pieces. This is actually something, if you look back at the original paper by Klevenov and Polyakov, they, they argue that there should, have been, there should be indeed a cancellation between disconnected contributions and connected contributions of the propagator and resulting in it disappearing from the spectrum. And that is one indication. Um, so what is, so how do I find a delta equals to two state? Well, it's not too difficult if you go back to the nonlinear signal model and you look at the shift. What you, the identification is here. Remember, phi naught minus one in momentum space is just k1 squared, that's k2 squared. Uh, so, 
The statement is that you should find uh, delta equals to two states, and though that uh, only exists when x is equal to y. So this has the form that this is alpha x delta x minus y. Now, uh, you need to be aware that if you start off with correlators of those objects, you have absolutely no guarantee a priori that you're going to get this kind of uh, uh, that you're going to get, for instance, if you look at the two-point functions between these two bilocals, you have no guarantee a priori that this is going to be proportional to a delta function, delta function times, uh, times uh, the two-point function of the alpha, but that's precisely what happens. So this is quite a strong consistency check of that. And one can show that these two states at the boundary are also a problem. <laughs> now, this, again, also requires that there is a precise cancellation between disconnected and connected pieces of the propagator. Okay, I should say that we are consistently using this representation for this integral. Uh, means that this, uh, sorry about that, that should be gamma over minus alpha. So in this case, the disconnected pieces using that regularization is not contributed. Um, so, I... So what I wanted to do now is to discuss just briefly a model that I'm trying to understand a little bit the existence of the states. Now, remember that one has um, this condition, which is normally associated that, uh, to the, so you have you can think of the potential by the total of the trees, and it's just equal to the regular potential. So if m squared, so typically the situation of symmetry breaking is m squared less than zero and lambda greater than zero. So you get your standard um, uh, symmetry breaking. But what happens if, uh, what does it, is there a mean? And, uh, Okay, to the case where if we want to keep this to be positive, uh, where lambda is negative. So if lambda is negative, then of course this is unbounded from uh, um, below. So you start off, so m squared positive. So essentially there, you expanding about, so this is lambda negative and lambda positive. So here you're expanding about an unstable lag. So maybe it's too not it's maybe it's not too surprising that uh, the existence of this pole of a tachyonic nature is nothing but uh, an indication indeed that you don't have a stable vacuum. Uh, and on the other hand, so what I wanted to understand a little bit better in the context of a sort of a model is the two different types of behavior. And, uh, this is uh, the reason why I consider. So what we're going to do is we're going to consider a, um, a non-relativistic uh, quantum mechanical system in the presence of a delta function. Why a delta function? Because if you look, for instance, at the equations of motion in the presence uh, in, the, in the covariant formulas, in the presence of uh, the, this uh, interacting lambda. Uh, this is proportional to the uh, delta function in terms of relative coordinates. So essentially, you kill one coordinate, and we can, might as well we, we can consider this type of uh, system. Uh, now we know that if uh, this um, coupling there for the strength of the Dirac uh, potential is negative, there is a bounce state. There's the energy in terms of minus v mod squared. So my v mod here places the role of lambda. Um, but then there are most of the solutions are in scattering states. This is the form of scattering states. Okay. Now you can see here the same, exactly the same uh, picture. So if you have a, if you have a negative well, a, a well because it is a, you know, V naught is negative. Um, you may not, ex you may expect the system to, uh, there's a bound state which becomes an increasingly more and more negative energy, so you may expect that the system will become uh, unstable and particles will fall. 
into that well. That's not the case, because you can see that whether a V0 is positive or negative, when you take the limit as V0 goes to, when the map, the model V0 goes to infinity, you get, um, you get that the wave function, which is psi of 0, is 0. So you set uh, x equals to 0, you get 1 minus 1. Okay. So this is interesting. I mean, you would probably have expected that if you had a V0 to be positive, you have a different PI one way or the other barrier. So yes, you expect the, the wave function to go to 0. Um, now, what we also did is we said, what happens if we do second quantization of the system? Uh, and we can go through this, the equivalent of what we did in terms of the two time uh, um, propagator. You end up with this expression, which is the free propagation plus, so again, two external states. And you have the structure, which is entirely equivalent to the vertex that I had uh, presented to you. And you see again that as V0 to so the mod, uh, so the, the, that integral can be done. It's very straightforward. Somewhere along the line, I put H boss to 1 and get mixed. So, so we would have this, uh, this uh, type of structure. So the pole condition would then be nothing but the condition of the bound state. Uh, and the propagator is finite as V0 goes to minus infinity. So the um, so we have, what happens also is if you look at the form of the wave functions, you see that psi of x then goes like sine, which precisely means that you're essentially setting a boundary condition at x equals to zero. And uh, so basically, there are two pictures, right? That um, perhaps understand a little bit better the proper condition. I mean, if, uh, one sticks to the standard uh, picture of the uh, of the infrared fixed point, which is normally obtained with the with the inverted uh, with the, with the Mexican hat type of potential. Then, uh, basically, as far as the map is concerned, it's very simple. All you have to do is to basically set a boundary condition on your the wave functions, instead of having plane waves, we have sine functions, but the algebra should carry through in a similar way, which is something we should, in any case, check by looking at the oscillator expansion in the conformal algebra. So I think I'll stop here. Okay, uh, do you have questions or comments? But you, hmm? Okay. Okay, yes. So, if I start with the path integral, mm -hmm. is there a clear way I can go to the signal sector and get the, that Hamiltonian of equal term bilocal? So, at the level of correlators, probably yes, because yes. what so one that, does is one of an intermediate energy. You know, basically, in the same way they've got two times, instead of one, we've got two energies, is the sum and the difference, we essentially integrating over E1 minus E2 if you want to restrict and you can do that consistently for operators acting on uh, on, on these bilocals, yes. Can you regain the Hamiltonian? Okay, uh, if you have no more questions, uh, let's thank you again.